Amen. Church, I want you to grab your Bibles. Open up to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we continue on in our series looking at John chapter 14 through 17. And here's what I want to do while you're flipping open to John chapter 15. I want to give you two things before we read this passage. I want to give you an encouragement and I want to give you a warning. I want to give you an encouragement about not only this passage of Scripture and an encouragement about this sermon, but also a warning about both. One, I want to encourage you that the purpose of this scripture that we're about to read from Jesus, this passage of scripture that Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he utters these words as an encouragement to his disciples. And I want you to know something about this sermon that I'm about to preach, is that my intent of this sermon is to encourage you that you would leave today encouraged in the midst of a world where there's trouble. And there is anxiety and brokenness. The warning is that it, right out of the box, may not seem like that. That's the warning I want to give you. Hang with me. Right out of the box in this sermon and with these words from Jesus, you might have a hard time seeing the encouragement in it. But trust me, it's there. Look at John chapter 15. Look at verse 18. Here Jesus has spent a chapter and a half trying to calm <laughs> He's trying to calm down his disciples. He's given them some words that's created trouble and stirred up their hearts and they're nervous. And he's trying to tell them, look, there's a future. This life is not all there is. I'm giving you my spirit. I'm giving you a call. I'm going to be with you. And then he drops these words on them. Verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, and that if there, by the way, in the Greek is not an uncertain term. It is a certain term in the Greek. It's not a matter of if. It is, it is going to. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would not love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I've said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they would also keep yours. But all these things will, they will do to you on account of my name because... They do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in the law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. Verse 26, he says, But when the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Let me tell you something about the Bible, not just in this passage of Scripture. The Bible warns repeatedly about some things. And here's one of the things that we see even in this passage of Scripture that Jesus is doing. Old Testament to New. He warns repeatedly about the reality, not the possibility. He warns about the reality of persecution. Persecution being whether it's verbal, ostracizing, physical, about being hated. That's the word he kept using here over and over again for following and living for Jesus. I'm going to take you on a little survey of Scripture here. Don't worry about getting all these. Just listen to it. I mean, even here in these first verses, he says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. I think about Paul talking to his little ministry student, Timothy. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will, not if, says they will be persecuted. I think of the greatest sermon that's ever been preached in Matthew 5 by Jesus. He says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when, not if, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He says, Rejoice and be glad. It says in Matthew 5, 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. First Peter chapter 3, verse 16 says, Have a good conscience. So that when, not if, when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Chapter later, Peter says this in, in chapter 4, verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in, in so far as, as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is, is revealed. Tells us in 2 Corinthians, Paul says in verse 12, For the sake of Christ... 
I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, for when I'm weak, then I am strong. Luke 6, 2, blessed are you when people, not if, when people hate you and when they exclude you and when they revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. 1 John 3, 13, do not be surprised, brothers, when the world hates you. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, he says this, we once were, what? We are now afflicted in every way, not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of death, in our body, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Tells us in John 16, 13, I've said these things to you so that you may have peace. In the world, you will have peace. Tribulation. I could go on and on and on, and you get my point now about my warning. This is not the most seemingly encouraging start to a sermon. If I were to end this right now, man, we'd just depressed. We'd all skip lunch and be like, I'm just going to go home and sit in the corner. That's what we want to do. I'm going to lock my doors after you hear verses like that. Let me tell you something. We're going to get there in a minute. He's making a point, though, and this is what I want you to miss. If you're just waking up now and you're going to go back to sleep in a minute, remember this one phrase. This is the whole sermon in a phrase. A Christian who has the audacity to actually go into the world and live for Christ publicly, follow Christ publicly, here's what God is apparently wanting you to understand. You ought to expect to be hated. That's the truth. Let me tell you something about God. He got it right in the first century. He got it right in the Old Testament. And he got it right now. He was doing more than making a prediction. He was telling us what was going to happen. Even in the world we live in now, in the first century, what did we see happen with the first followers? They were all murdered. Except for one, he was exiled to an island as an enemy of the state. The rest of them, James had his head beaten in with a club. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. You look at the world today, we look at Christian research groups, what they would tell us about the world we live in now, there are 111 countries who either restrict or are hostile to Christianity in the world. We live in now. I mean, we would look at the world according to these studies, and there are some 100, 100 million Christians in the world we live in today who are suffering persecution across the globe. You look in countries like North Korea alone, there's 50 to 70,000 Christians who are sitting in detention camps today. And we would look at that and say, well, that's not the United States of America. Let me tell you something. It can happen here, and it does happen here. Buckle up in the United States of America. Buckle up. Country we live in, let me tell you what is on the rise. Two things are on the rise in the United States of America. Tolerance for an anti-Christ and anti-Christian attitude, that's on the rise. And let me tell you what else is on the rise. Isolation and discrimination against people who would dare to live for Jesus Christ. And it may show up in in people forcing a business to to betray their beliefs in Christ Jesus. It may show up in indoctrination in our schools. It may show up in in pressure from even government agencies who would would want to put pressure and and label Christians who want to live according to God's word as extreme and terrorist. It may show up as as allowing everybody under the sun to hand out tracts on Halloween but being forced to not do it if you're a Christian. It, It may show up in all sorts of number of ways. It'll show up in even just the changing of our country. Let me tell you the rising population in our country. It's a group called the Don'ts. We track this as pastors. And let me tell you what the definition of a don't is in our country. The definition of a don't is a group of people who would say that they don't know, don't care, and don't believe that God exists. That group of people in the United States of America is rapidly growing. Church attendance rapidly decreasing. This group of people who would classify themselves as I don't know, don't care, and don't want to believe in God, let me tell you what, it has risen 34% in the last decade. 43% amongst those who are 18 to a little bit younger than me, millennials. There have been, amongst people who once claimed to be Christians, a 15% decrease in the last two decades. Even amongst Christians, let me throw this one out there, even for people that are still claiming Christ... In the last 20 years, there has been a 30% decrease in those who would say that the Bible is the Word of God. 51% of those who were born 
18 to 36, that millennial generation, 51% in the world we live in today would say reincarnation is a real thing and possible. I mean, I could go all day and tell you this is the world that we live in. George Barnard says the new America that we see emerging is radically different demographically, politically, relationally, and spiritually. Let me tell you the term that people like to phrase America. I think they've got it a little bit off. I have a more hopeful view. They would say we live in a post Christian America. For a sermon for another day is I would rather say we live in a pre-Christian America. We got work to do. The harvest field is out there. It's ripe for the harvest. But let's let's just look at these things. I think a lot of people would look at this and say, well, what's the reason why? I mean, here's what Jesus is telling us. We live in a world from Old Testament to the first century to now where he pegged it. He got it absolutely right. It is fundamentally opposed to Christ. Jesus is fundamentally opposed to, to Christians. And here's the question I want us to look at. Jesus begins to answer the questions maybe that they asked or that they were thinking. Why? Why do they hate Christians? I mean, it's an amazing thing. I would think through all generations, you would look at the people in every society who were following the rules, who were helping the homeless, who were taking in the indigent, who were taking in the the orphans, the apple of the eye of every society. And let me tell you who they are. Christ followers, and yet they're the most persecuted. Why? Why? Let me tell you why, and Jesus begins to describe it right now. Let me tell you the first reason Jesus says. The reason why the world hates Christians is, first of all, because look at verse 18 and verse 20, because the world hates Jesus. We may live in what we call a post-Christian America, but here's the truth about the world as long as it's existed. It's always been post-Jesus, and it's been anti-Jesus. Look at verse 18. Jesus says this from the very beginning. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. He says in verse 20, remember the world, the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Here's what we begin to learn. The world hates Jesus, I mean, literally, 24 hours after he wrote these words, what happened to him? He was falsely accused, falsely arrested. He was mocked, beaten, and executed as a criminal less than one day after he wrote these words. They hated him then, and make no mistake, in 2022, what the world think about Jesus? They hate Jesus. The world hates Jesus, and here's the reason why the world hates Jesus, because the world is permeated and infected with a disease we call sin. And what sin does to us when it infects all of humanity is sin causes people, and it predisposes people apart from Jesus Christ to be fundamentally opposed to who God is and it causes us to be fundamentally opposed to all that God is working and doing in the world. When we have sin affecting who we are in our flesh, it sets itself up against God and you can't stop it. I mean, we know this. We look at Scripture. Again, Jeremiah 17, 9 describes our heart. Apart from Jesus and the filling of the Holy Spirit, what is our heart? The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Who can understand it? I mean, Titus says in in chapter 1, to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Ephesians 4, 17 through 18, talks about who we are before Jesus Christ. How does it describe us? We are what? Living in the futility of our minds, darkened in our understanding, alienated from the life of God because of what? Ignorance that's in us due to the hardness of our hearts. The world hates Jesus. He begins to tell us why. He even gets a little more detailed. He says, you want me to tell you why they hate me and why they hated me, they hate me now? He says in verse 22 and 23, the world hates Jesus. Why? Because of his words. Look at verses 22 and 23. If I hadn't come spoken to them, they wouldn't be guilty of their sin. There wouldn't be guilt. It wouldn't be shame. If I didn't come and speak to them and tell them the gospel, let me tell you something about the gospel. In order for you to get to the good news of the gospel, you, you got to share the bad news first. In order for anybody to understand that they need the good news, which is Jesus dying on the cross for my sins, I have to recognize the bad news, which is I'm sinful. I'm not perfect. Sin has permeated and infected me as well. I mean, I think about it. Jesus says people don't like to hear that in this world. Even Paul was saying that in 1 Corinthians 1, 23. He says, but we preach Christ crucified. And here's the reaction Paul says you're going to get from the world. It's going to be a stumbling block to the Jews, and it'll be folly to the Gentiles. I love the New Living Translation. It words it like this. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles will say it's all nonsense. 
You'll have people in the world that will hear the words of Christ Jesus literally from his mouth and from his followers' mouths, and they'll take one of two stances most of the time because of their sin. They'll either think it's complete, utter foolishness or nonsense, or they'll take offense to it. It's why Jesus was murdered. The gospel's offensive. Think of a story that Harry H.I. Ironside told. He told a story of a missionary ministering in Africa. And he said in an encounter with this African chief's wife who happened to visit the mission statement, mission station one day and says that you know, outside of his kind of missionary's cabin, he had a tree where he hung a little mirror. That was where he would wash up and shave for the day as a missionary. He said that this African chief's wife had showed up and walked by that mirror, had never seen her own reflection before, living in a pagan lifestyle, maybe curious here about what this Jesus talks all about. And since she walked up and saw her face for the first time, in this little mirror. And as the story goes, it said she was horrified with it. She could see all of the markings that she had from this pagan culture and the, the evil kind of features of all that on her face and was horrified, but didn't realize it was a mirror, had never seen this before. And, and, and told Harry and told the missionary, well, who is this hideous person in the tree? And he said as tactful as he could, the missionary had to look at it and be like, well, it, it's... There's, there's no person in the tree. It's a mirror that what you're seeing is, is you. Said that, that, that the chief's wife was just horrified. My goodness. Started to begging him, sell me that mirror. I need that mirror. And they kind of went back and forth. Finally got the mirror. And immediately when they bought it, shattered it to the ground. Threw it in the ground in a million pieces. I don't want to get this part right. And here was the quote. I will never have it making faces at me again. Let me tell you why the world doesn't like Jesus' word and why they didn't like Jesus. Because what it does, the truth reveals who we really are. It reveals our true self. It's hard. It's painful. Thank God. It reveals my true predicament without Jesus. Without Jesus, I'm dead. I'm a dead person, dead in my trespasses, Ephesians 2 says. Dead. They not only hated his words because it exposed the truth of their sin, the world hates his works for the exact same reason. We see that in verse 24. I mean, in verse 24, he says, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have been guilty of sin. Not only did he come and reveal the truth, and it made them guilty, and they didn't like it, even his works did that. Every single time I went through the scripture, and I looked at the reaction of people that were followers of Jesus, and people that weren't followers of Jesus, whenever he did a miracle, whenever he did a work, let me tell you the word that shows up most often, astonished. People were astonished. Most of the time, even when Jesus spoke, people were astonished. Even the people that were spying on him. These little spies from the Pharisees would show up and hear Jesus speak, and they'd go back to the Pharisees, and you know what their response was? We've never heard a single person ever talk like that before. Never. I've never seen somebody do that. You can say what you want to say about him. You may think he's a heretic. You may think he's a blasphemer. That dead person's walking around right now, though. That leper has a nose, and they didn't have a nose before. My daughter was dead and is not dead anymore. That person's ear just got put back on. It was astonishing. And let me tell you why it made them feel guilty. Because until they had seen God work, their works seemed pretty good. Their righteousness seemed pretty great until they saw the real thing. And then they thought, hmm, maybe my righteousness does look like filthy rags. Man-made. It was convicting. All of this, Jesus is just warning them, look, the world hates me. And here's the second thing he teaches them about this. Why? Why do they hate Christians? Because they hate Jesus. Number two, they don't. They hate Christians because we're not of the world. Let me put that in another way. They hate Christians because we have the audacity. If they hate Christ, they're going to surely hate the people that want to serve and model their lives after Jesus Christ. Of course they're going to hate us. You look at Scripture, and here's what happened. Of course, when we came to know Jesus Christ, not only were we called out of our sin, but we were called into something. That's what I love. We were called into a family. I love Scripture. We look at Scripture, and what does it say in 1 Peter? It says, we, we, he set us apart. When we got saved, not only did he take our sin away from us, he took us and sanctified us. Took us and said, I'm going to call y'all out of this mess. Out of your sin. Out of this group of people that are dying and move you to life. 
And I'm going to make you what? What does he tell us? I'm going to make you a royal priesthood, a chosen race, a holy nation. He goes on to say in 1 Peter, what else I'm going to do? I'm going to make you a peculiar people, aliens, exiles, sojourners. When you walk around this world now because of what I've done, you should look, act, speak, and people should notice that you're different. You're not from here anymore. Let me tell you something about people. People don't like things they don't understand typically. Tells him in that same passage of Scripture in 1 Peter 2, verse 12, he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they will see your good deeds and glorify God on that day of visitation. I mean, I think about 1 Peter 4, 14. This passage, he tells them, here's the deal. You've been set free from your flesh. You once were people who used to live according to your passions, not to the will of God, but now all that's changed. And listen to what he says. He says in verse 3, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. He says, But with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. The world will see a change. They'll see something different. And guess what? Just as Jesus' words and works made them feel guilty and exposed their true selves, when they look at people whose lives have been changed and it's a working of an almighty God, they will what, according to Peter? They'll malign you and attack you. I love it. Matt Carter said this, Pastor. He says, they will hate you because you're different, but you're different because God called you to be different, and your difference is what makes the gospel shine brighter one they hate christians because they hate jesus too they hate christians because we have the audacity to have been changed and transformed into his, into his image and then third very quickly the world hates christians why because not only have we been called out they haven't they're still separated from god and it's a small point i almost didn't put it in the sermon but i think it's important i think sometimes we get frustrated with the world because the world acts like the world The world is exactly the same as it always has been. It's just like what we were before we were called out of this world. The world's blind. And we get frustrated because they can't see. They're blind. I'm going to get frustrated because they can't describe for me what a tree is. They ain't never seen it. They haven't tasted and seen of its goodness. All they know is following the prince and the power of this age and the futility of their minds. All they know is sin. They don't even know anything different. I mean, I think for us, what do we expect? We expect the world to act like Christians. They're lost. They are, as we've already covered in here, predisposed to hate God. They are going to hate Christ's followers. Here's what I want to get to, and this is the part where we get to the encouragement part with the rest of this time. Again, we still hadn't gotten to it yet. You might be sitting here and being like, I'm still, I'm looking for it, Pastor Brad. Where is it, man? (laughs) Kind of painted a pretty dark portrait here. And maybe you've explained why it's dark, but what do we do? There's the question I read. I read these words from Jesus, and if I were sitting there with Jesus, I'd be like, Jesus, okay. I can expect that I'm going to be hated. And I can at least expect I'm going to be hated because they hated you, and I'm going to follow you no matter what. So here's the thing. I would ask, okay, how am I supposed to handle that? I'm going to walk out of here today and have to have the audacity, which in these days and age, there's a lot of people who claim to be Christians, but I don't think they have the audacity to go out there and live for Jesus, number one. I don't think they really have any running any risk at this point of being hated. I'm not sure anybody knows the difference. But if we want to walk out of here, this is what I'd say, and I'm going to take you up on this Jesus, and I'm going to go and transform to live in your image. I'm going to expect to be hated. What, how am I supposed to handle that? I think Jesus gives us, and God gives us all through his word, encouragement. Let me tell you what, Jesus shared all of this, believe it or not, again, because he wanted to encourage. And let me tell you the main reason he wanted to share this with his disciples, so that they would be prepared. He didn't want them caught off guard. He didn't want them disillusioned in here. Let me tell you the first thing that we learn from this that's encouraging as we make our way into the world. Let me tell you a first thing that we ought to do that will encourage us. We ought to work hard to try to not gain love from the world. Well, you want to be encouraged with the hatred? You want to know how you make it through it? Don't seek love from the world. In the world we live in, let me tell you something, that seems wrong. That seems the opposite of what the world would tell us. Everybody on the planet, let me tell you what their number one goal is, to be loved by the world. I don't think the real temptation and the struggle for us as Christians 
is to want to love Jesus. I think the real struggle for us is that we secretly still want to be loved by the world. I heard a pastor say it like this. I think there's a part of us that wants our cake and eat it too. We, we want God to change our lives, but we would also like to keep our worldly reputations as well. It don't work like that. Jesus says, if you're with me, you're with me. It's like the wings of an airplane. I can't be in love with Jesus and in love with the world. I can't be loved by Jesus and also loved by the world. I didn't make these rules. He did. I make up my mind. I'm all in with Jesus. That means I'm going to already expect that the world's probably not going to have a super high opinion of me. And I make my peace with that. But I think a lot of us struggle because we'd say, oh, yeah, I want Jesus and all of that forgiveness part and I want to go to heaven and I want him to forgive me and all this, but I'd also like to be not persecuted. And I would like the world to really think I'm something. I'm not saying that's not possible. There are times where outsiders may think we're, we're the kinds of people. I've listened to Jesus' words, though, and here's what I'm saying. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. James, Jesus' half-brother, says in James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world, what? Makes himself an enemy of God. You cannot have it both ways. There's an intrinsic part of our flesh and our, and our sinful flesh that is selfish. And here's the thing. It wants to be liked. And somehow we fool ourselves into thinking that we can... We'll fool ourselves into thinking this word's not true. That we're greater than our master. That's the truth I'm just realizing as I'm reading this even now. That somehow, even though Jesus was hated and he was the perfect person that ever lived, somehow I'm going to manage to be liked by the world. Look, they let a murderer, Barabbas, go. Instead of Jesus. And I think they're going to pick me. It's foolish. I think the question we ask ourselves, and we ought to ask ourselves today as we come to the end of this time, is do we struggle with this? Do you struggle with this? And let me just let ourselves off the hook. And what I mean by that is, do you struggle? If you were to sit here and say, yeah, do I have this need to be liked? Would you say yes or no? Answer that quietly. Or let me ask myself, do I have this want to be comforted and hope in knowing that I'm loved? And let me tell you what, I think that the answer we would all say if we're being honest is yes. And can I tell you something? That's perfectly okay, actually. Wanting to be liked is a great thing. I, I, of course I want to be liked. Of course I want to be loved. Of course I want to be comforted with love. I don't think there's actually anything wrong with that. Let me tell you when the problem comes. It, it comes in whom and what we're looking to receive that comfort and hope and love from. The problem is not wanting to be liked. The problem is that I want to be liked more by the world than I do my Lord and my Master and my Savior. The problem comes when we seek attention and approval from the world more than we do our Heavenly Father. Here's the truth of our walk with Christ Jesus. If we have been set free in Christ Jesus, let me tell you what our hope is. It is all, 100% of it, in Jesus alone. The world, not even 1% of my hope should be in the world. If I've been set free in Jesus Christ, let me tell you where your confidence ought to be. Not in your bank account, not in your boss, not in your position, not in your skills and your gifts. 100% of your confidence is found in Jesus alone. Your identity, who you are, it has no percentage of is it determined by what the world thinks of you. Praise God. They could think you're a scoundrel and a heretic and a bigot, and a terrorist, and a fundamental extremist, whatever they want to call you. Let me tell you why it's awesome that Jesus is my Savior, because all of my identity is in Jesus. It don't matter what the world thinks of me. My identity is not dependent upon what they think of us. There's freedom in that and encouragement in that. gives us an opportunity to take risk. I mean, I think of 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord and as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you. It's Jesus. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot love and live for Christ and be loved by the world. The world, let me tell you what, the world will only love you if you compromise on Jesus. Let me tell you the kind of Christians that the world loves. Incognito Christians. Those are the ones that the world loves. The ones who say they're a Christian, but they keep it under a bushel and a basket. Let me tell you the second thing, and we're in with this one point. I kind of jumbled them all together. We ought to, one, 
grow in our walk with the Lord and our love for the Lord and not the world. And number two, we ought to not stop believing and sharing. And I probably should have thrown another word on there. We ought to not stop believing. We ought to not stop sharing the gospel. And we ought to not stop loving the world even when they hate us. I mean, Jesus gave us all these warnings not to scare the pants off of us. He gave it to tell us the truth because the truth protects his disciples from falling away. I mean, look at the first four verses of chapter 16 very quickly. Jesus tells us why he told all this. What, to, to scare the crud out of him? No, he says, I've said all these things to you to keep you from what? Falling away. Hard times are coming. And let me tell you what the, the worst thing is about those hard times coming. It's, it's really not... The, the suffering, it's not even the persecution, it's not the loss of things, it's the risk of what? Giving up. He says in verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Let me tell you what, that was probably worse than death in the first century. We don't have time to get into it. If you love studying the Bible, go study it. What would have happened when you were no longer considered a Jew anymore? You might as well be dead. Your family might even have a funeral in the first century to pretend like you were dead. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. They're going to do this and persecute you and think it's good. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Let me tell you what. I think one of the blessings we have of Jesus maybe causing this anxiety this morning is that I don't walk out there and I get sucker punched thinking it's not supposed to happen. It's why we warn our kids when we rip Band-Aids off of them. Hey, by the way, this is going to hurt a little bit. It's for your good. It's going to hurt a little bit. Remember when I was learning to play baseball, very quickly here, when I was learning to play baseball, I was scared of getting hit. Never got hit with a pitch before, made all-stars, I was playing real good, I'm batting. God beamed me one time and I thought, ooh, I didn't like that. Even when it came close, I was like, wait a minute, man, that, that, that might hurt. And let me tell you what, without me even thinking about it, that fear caused me to always step left. I just wanted to get out of the way. Even before the pitch came, I was already halfway down third baseline. I was like, yeah, let me just, uh, maybe, he'll, maybe he'll just throw balls or whatever. And my dad took me out in the back in our 70 yards. He took me up against the back of a, a barn, and he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw you some pitches. I'm your dad, right? You trust me? Yes, let me throw you some pitches. You'll work on your hidden. And he purposefully, like 10 times in a row, beamed me with a baseball. I'm like, Dad, you just asked me if I trust you. And I mean, he hummed it. Pow! He would hit me, and I'm thinking, man. He's like, no, don't turn your leg that way. He kept hitting me. At the end of the day, he said, it hurt. I'm like, yeah. Are you still standing here? Are you alive? Was it just crippling? No, nah, it's okay. I think this was Jesus' heart. Look, you're going to make it through this. Not only that, you should rejoice in it. You ought to look at it as an opportunity, not only for you to grow, not only for you to grow in your trust and your faith in me, grow in your walk, put sin to death, but these are opportunities, even though the world hates you, they're really opportunities, they're not obstacles for the growth of the gospel. Let me tell you what, we live in a world that even Christians these days lie to Christ followers. Let me tell you something, if you go to any church in this area, you turn on your radio and you hear a preacher that's telling you that when you follow Jesus, what you ought to expect is good health, riches, and luxury now, let me tell you something. Uh, they're selling you false goods. Following Jesus leads to suffering and persecution. There is a cost to being a disciple, but here's what I want to encourage you with. The treasure that we gain in Christ Jesus is worth that cost. The treasure of knowing Jesus is worth the cross. In the face of intense persecution, here's what we do. We hold on to the truth. We cling tightly to Jesus. We live for Jesus even if there's severe persecution and we don't fall away. Instead, we rejoice because God's Spirit will be with us in a unique way just as He was in the sufferings of Jesus. What is the greatest danger that we face in times of persecution? It's not injury. It's not death. It's falling away. So when we're persecuted, when we're reviled, when we're hated, what do we do? Because of Jesus and for Jesus, we rejoice and we keep sharing and we keep loving. Last story. I want to end with this because it's so good. I can't even remember where I heard it. I heard a story about this little boy named Stevie. He was quiet. He was shy. He moved to a new neighborhood. I know what it's like to be the new guy in the new neighborhood. So it was a little boy, and he went to school. He came home one day, and he said, Mom, it's about to be Valentine's Day. Here's what I want to do. I want to make a Valentine for everybody in my class because I love them. And imagine your kid came to you and said that. You'd be like, oh, that is so sweet. 
but it made his mom's heart sink because she had watched every day when he got off the bus, all the kids, because he was the new kid, they would come laughing, hanging out, and having conversations. They'd all be in a big group. And Stevie would be by himself. He's the new kid. And her heart sank because she felt like, and she knew, he was going to go give all these valentines and he won't get none in return. You don't want to discourage your kid from doing something that's awesome like that. So she went and bought him crayons and glue and construction paper and he made homemade valentines for everybody he could think of in his class. And his mom said he tucked them under his arm and he walked out to the bus and she said her heart was just grieved. She knew that it was going to be a hard day. So she made him some cookies and some milk and said when he gets home, boy, I'm going to just comfort him. She waited all day and guess what? Saw the bus come down the road and same thing happened. All the kids got together and they were talking and laughing and hanging out. And Stevie was by himself, walking a little faster than normal. And she's thinking, this is terrible. He's so hurt. He's coming home and he's, he's broken hearted. And she came in and the first thing out of his mouth, although his face looked a little different, maybe not as upset, was not one was the word out of his mouth. Not one single time, not one single one, all of them. And she's thinking, I know it. I'm so sorry you didn't get any Valentines. No, he said, that's not what I meant at all. He says this, not one, not one single one. I didn't forget one. They all know that I love them. Didn't get a single Valentine, but that wasn't the goal. The goal of giving the Valentines wasn't so you could get them in return. The goal of giving the Valentines was so that they would know that you love them. The goal of living for Jesus is to bask in the glory and the riches and the treasures of knowing Jesus. And the reason why we love the world is not because they love us, not because they think we're the best thing ever. It is because we want them to know the love of Jesus. I want to share Jesus' love with people, not for what I can get out of it, but what Jesus' glory will be displayed because of it and what people's lives will be changed. We're going to be hated, we're going to be persecuted. It ought not silence us. It's not an excuse for silence. It ought to fuel us to say, if he can save me, if he can save a terrorist like Paul, he can do it with anybody. We are called to be people who don't revile when we're reviled. We don't repay with how the world treats us. We love like Jesus loved us. Amen? We have an opportunity to respond this morning to the word of God. I pray that you would. That's all I ask. God's word's been preached. It will go out. Not return void means it's going to accomplish what it wants to accomplish. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're anxious. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're an incognito Christian. Maybe you need to come to this altar and say, God, I repent. I turn away. Maybe you need to know Jesus this morning. I pray you'd come talk to me. I would beg you. Come talk to me. I'll introduce you to Jesus this morning. Maybe you want to join our church. You want to come and be a part of this fellowship. Tired of doing this walk together by, uh, with, by yourself, not together? Come on. Come on, we, we have space for you. God wants you here to serve. He's got a great work, I'm convinced of it, through his people here at Eastwood, and you get to be a part of it, privileged to be a part of it. You come and let us know. Whatever it is, I'd ask that you just don't do nothing. You move, you come, you come to the altar, kneel, come and find somebody, and let's pray. Let's stand together as we have an opportunity to respond to the word this morning. Father God, we praise you, we do thank you. I thank you for your word. God, even when it sometimes scares me a little bit, <laughs> God, when your word makes me anxious, even some ways, I find peace in knowing that you've got all the bases covered. You're never going to leave us, never going to run out on us. Even when the world hates us, that's okay. My worth, my confidence, my hope, it's all in you, and you ain't going anywhere. Thank you, Jesus. I pray in this time, God, that we would respond how the Holy Spirit moves us and leads us to respond. You'd speak to us, that we would respond in obedience. We pray all this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.